welcome to this afternoon's session that's uh, going to look at um, the report that we um, recently did on avoiding low bridge strikes. <clears throat> um, that was some work that uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Dave Roding, did. Um, and um, as I'm sure you will have seen, um, as you travel around, um, there's an awful lot of um, strikes of bridges that, that take place. Um, it's a major problem um, and um, we thought that uh, it's something that we ought to um, try and raise awareness of some of the solutions that have been um, being introduced um, over the last couple of years that might uh, help. So this afternoon, we're going to have a look at the incidence of, of strikes, um, have a look at some of the signage um, for um, trying to help avoid it, um, and some of the things that we can do to help limit uh, the number of bridge strikes, particularly for public transport vehicles. Um, and in that we're going to have a look at some of the things that operators can do from a system point of view and then uh, technological aids. Um, do welcome questions if you put them in the chat or we can um, uh, have a verbal discussion uh, afterwards. Um, so um, <clears throat> to the casual observer, um, when you've got professional drivers driving high-sided vehicles and public transport vehicles with what appears on the face of it to be quite a lot of signage around bridges, you wonder why strikes actually happen. Um, they shouldn't, uh, shouldn't really um, be occurring. Um, but there's an awful lot of... Um, strikes that are taking place. Typically, there's about five strikes a day in the UK. Um, so that's in 2019, there were over 1,700 um, and there were 14 uh, on one day. Now, most bridges that get struck are rail bridges. Um, and so um, that has a huge knock-on effect on the rail side of public transport. Um, having said that there's over 1,700 um, brute strikes in 2019, typically every year there's there's actually only 40 to 50 bus and coach strikes a year, which is only 2.5% of, of the strikes, so a small proportion, uh, but a very damaging proportion. And, and you know that there's a problem when the regulator, the traffic commissioner, says in their annual report um, that there's an unacceptable number of bridge strikes and that they're astonished by operators lackadaisical approach to the prevention of them so you, you know that that's a that's a major rant from a regulator um, so they're very keen that people um, take notice and do something about it um, public transport strikes um, are really um, based around four sort of uh, causes. Um, going offline on a planned route, um, uh, when somebody has to do something other than the normal scheduled route. So it could be a diversion, or it could be somebody just making a wrong turn and coming across a bridge that they're not expecting. Um, a lot um, are what you would say are not in service, taking a shortcut, um, an engineer driving to a to a between depots or going to a garage or or something like that. Um, some drivers with insufficient route knowledge um, leading to the wrong turns and um, you know uh, coming across things that they shouldn't. Um, and then the other one. Um, is where it's a normally a single deck route and and for whatever operational reason there's a double decker put on it for that particular journey the consequences um of bridge strikes from a public transport 
operator's perspective are quite significant. Um, in 2020, the Senior Traffic Commissioner, Richard Turfitt, um, updated the, um, uh, the guidance um, and um, the starting point for action against the driver that has a bridge strike um, through carelessness or negligence is loss of their license and disqualification for six months. So that's basically loss of your job. Um, that's as about as serious as uh, as the commissioner can get. Um, obviously, police might start criminal proceedings and things like that, particularly where somebody's injured. Um, but as an opco, um, ultimately, it can lead to loss of the operating license um, and some significant costs. Um, on average, a, a bridge strike delays trains that uh, are using the, the track above um, for two hours. Um, and the the cost of examining um, a bridge um, and clearing up the road and things like that, averaging about £13,000. Um, and um, the, um, the biggest claim against an operator for a, for a strike for delayed services um, was back in 2019, uh, where there was a 1.8 million um, cost to the uh, delayed trains. So really significant hit on, hopefully, insurance company rather than uh, an OPCO's um, uh, bank account, but still uh, very serious um, and significant. Um, the media always like to uh, highlight when public transport hits a bridge. Um, you rarely see anything about um, lorries hitting bridges unless it's causing major long-term problems. Um, but um, where um, they do occur, um, they do like to make coverage, uh, often national. Um, and uh, and it's things like driver of double decker bus which uh, slammed into a low railway bridge and killed a passenger, uh, and he'd been taking a different route to avoid a traffic jam. Um, he'd taken the road in question many times before, but only a single decker vehicle, and he was in a double decker this time, um, and um, that caused. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the the death of one of the passengers and uh, injuries to a to a dozen more, um, and um, I mean, it, it always amazes me that you can peel the roof off a off a bus um, where um, it hits a low bridge, um, and um, Witnesses said uh, in in the in the bottom picture heard almighty bang. We jumped and turned around, and the bus kept going quite fast, like nothing had happened. Things were falling off it, and you can see in the distance, hundred odd meters down the road, the bus when it finally came to a stop. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, quite often it's school buses that are involved because it's busy times and. Um, varying routes and things like that, and um, uh, a dozen um, kids were had had to be taken to hospital in one case when um, it was a new driver and hadn't been properly familiarised with the route. Um, the kids knew that the bus um, wasn't going to fit through and were braced for impact, but uh, still, um, unfortunately, they got injured. Um, so. Um, Coverage um, is not very helpful to trying to persuade people to use public transport. Um, and so uh, uh, if we can avoid it, we should. Um, there's quite a lot in regulations and rules about signage uh, to try and help people um, avoid strikes. Um, the road vehicles regulations um, require um, vehicles that are over three metres high to have a notice in the cab. 
um, that displays the height of the vehicle in, in feet and inches um, or feet, inches and metres. Um, it does need somebody to pay attention to it um, when you um, get into the driving seat to, to see it and uh, clock the height and think about it. Um, so there are things that you can do um, to help try and make a driver understand the height you know, when they're uh, accepting a vehicle um, for, a, for a run, making them write down the height on, on the um, sign out sheet and things like that. Um, in terms of the road network, the report goes through um, all sorts of um, things about signage um, and different types of bridges. You know, some are nice flat, some are curved, and you have to go into the middle. Um, and if you have to swerve to avoid a vehicle, other vehicle coming towards you, um, sometimes uh, that causes you to uh, hit the, the, the top and things like that. Um, but you know, standard road rules, red circles on signs prohibit. You, know, you must not do something and triangles. Um, our warning, um, you shouldn't do something. Um, so but the report goes into a lot of uh, lot of detail about that. Um, an interesting thing that Dave found um, in his research was um, that although the OS um, and Network Ra Ordnance Survey and Network Rail do regular surveys of heights of um, bridges, um, you do need to um, keep an eye on what's happening because if a road gets resurfaced and things like that and you're not that far off um, the height limit, um, you might find that uh, that actually after the resurfacing there's a problem when there wasn't one before. Um, so uh, it is always worth um, keeping an eye on what's going on on bus routes to make sure that sort of thing doesn't happen. Um, so what can we do um, about um, limiting um, bridge strikes? Um, as I said, um, Traffic Commissioner um, is obviously quite um, annoyed about the number of strikes because um, there's been multiple um text in his uh, annual reports um, and the, the 2021 um, reminds operators that they should be in a position to assess the risks um, attached to their uh, operations um, and that should take appropriate control measures to mitigate the risk of bridge strike, including route planning in advance um, and providing drivers with adequate information about vehicles. Um, you can do all sorts of things um, to help try and alleviate it, um, but I don't think there's any one thing that is going to stop things. It's the combination, and it's the combination over the long term um, that's actually going to make the difference. Um, and um, whilst the safe operation of a vehicle um, lies with the driver, you know, they should stop before they uh, actually hit a low bridge. Um, the accountability um, for the operation of all of the vehicles and, and, and the business does lie with the management team um, who can be held liable um, if there aren't proper safe systems of work. Um, uh, if you're not doing enough to help your drivers, um, then management um, can be held liable as well. So what can um, an operator do? Um, so there are some basic um, practical things that can be done. Um, so risk assessments, um, walking the routes and things like that. Um, if you know you've got a lot of low bridges um, in an area, then that's of a risk of, of strikes is going to be greater than if you're in an area with um, 
very few um, railway bridges. You know, if you're operating in in the flatlands of of Norfolk, um, it's probably lower risk than uh, than if you're in Yorkshire um, or uh, Leicestershire, for example. Um, there's quite a lot you can do with driver training from um, awareness of the notices and signage and things like that. Um, but um, there's also um, making sure that your drivers know the routes properly. Um, and um, if there are regular diversion routes, um, uh, because uh, if there's a road that's flooded or there's an accident on a stretch, this is where the police are likely to divert you, then uh, make sure that they're aware of those and the risks um, along those uh, routes. Um, might not just be um, low bridges um, on diversion routes. You might often find that uh, tree growth uh, means that vehicles need to go into the middle of the road or uh, sometimes just can't go along that road, because, whereas they could a year before because of tree growth. So there's lots of different things um, around diversion routes where um, awareness and familiarisation uh, can can be really helpful. Um, and um, when you do have um, strikes and accidents, um, making sure that they're properly reviewed, um, properly analysed, and the causes uh, identified and mitigated. Um, so, you know, is there an alternative diversion route that we can take? Um, how do we stop um, double decker being put on a route that can only take a single decker? Those sort of things. Um, there's quite a lot that you can do with councils and network rail, particularly if you're planning new routes or, or amended routes, making sure that um you work with them to understand the risks and, and where there might be problems um and driving those routes to just to make sure that there aren't any problems um and every depot um should have a central register of low structures in the control room so that dispatchers um have a ready reference of of where there are uh risks of, of problems um, and um, it seems that best practice would be that um, you have a board somewhere where drivers can uh, see the list of, of low bridges um, as well um, as well as things like uh, where there are diversions and, and the risks on those diversions um, but perhaps one of the um, one of the easiest um, and simplest ways of um, reducing the risk is to um, make sure that vehicle allocation is robust um, and bears it in mind. Um, picture from um, Graham, I believe, um, of one of the, their um, um, allocation boards, um, really quite nice and simple. Um, so there's a way of um, identifying the uh, the routes, um, and then each vehicle has a uh, magnetic um, tag that's color coded, um, and you can should only see red and red, um, where you see um, red with a with a blue and yellow tag you know you've got a problem really nice simple easy to see way that actually we've got a problem um, and we need to deal with it um really intuitive um and the sort of thing that's quite simple and easy to do um that's going to make a difference um one of the the challenges of course is if something goes wrong with a vehicle um part way through uh, its operation and you put out an alternative vehicle um, there's a that's high risk um particularly if you don't have a uh, a spare single decker 
um, to put out. Um, and those are the times when you need to be extra careful and make sure that your dispatchers um, are paying attention. So that's some of the um, operational things. Um, of course, being Arctic, um, we looked at technology um, and how technology can help. Um, so at the most basic level, um, route planning systems, your, um, your timetabling and scheduling systems, um, can they uh, be useful? Um, some of the um, newer versions of these systems that are using um, Ordnance Survey Master Map in particular, um, that's got um, road heights and, and things like that. Um, and um, if you try and uh, plan a route along a stretch of road that's got a, uh, a low bridge, then um, it flags up that um, there's a problem. Um, and you can also get um, at least one of them to um, reroute um, around um, roads where you don't have a low bridge. So um, avoiding right from the problem right from the start um, is always a good thing. Um, so have a look at what your scheduling systems can do. Um, and make sure that you're using those capabilities. Um, and then um, once you've got your route planned, um, there are a way of helping bus drivers um, be warned when they're in the vicinity of a low bridge um, along their route. Um, there's quite a there's a number of different um, GPS based location. Um, alerting systems out there um, that will um, alert people and we'll have a look at some of those um, in a second um, but the key to remember about these uh, driving aids um, is that they are just that they're a driving aid um, until we've got fully all automated and autonomous vehicles um, all it is is something to help people. Um, it's not a safety system. Um, you, know, you can get things to, to ring bells and flash messages and things like that. Um, but whilst ever you've got a human involved, uh, you've got risk that needs to be managed consistently. Um, even if you have spent lots of money on um, technology. Um, a number of these systems are relatively new um, and haven't been around and implemented for that long. One that's been around for a while um, is the uh, IBUS system. Um, and um, as far back as 2007, um, when London was having a um, particularly bad um, uh, spate of bridge strikes um, from lorries and public transport vehicles um, added to IBUS was a low bridge warning which um, gives you two levels of low bridge uh, alerts I and mean, there's one coming up and oh it's really close you might want to do something um, and um, it makes uh, um, both um, noise but also flashes on the uh, on the driver's screen um to uh, to try and uh, alert people the the driver visually um the driver doesn't need to um acknowledge the alarm because actually the last thing you want to do when they've got alerts going off and things like that is to uh, is to distract them by making them press buttons and things like that um and um, one of the key things um, about the IBUS system that um, most of the other ones um, also um, adopt is actually you don't want the bus to have to be signed into the ticket machine and running a route and things like that. Um, you want this to be working um, whatever state the vehicle is, whether it's in or out of service, because 
a good proportion of the strikes are happening when um, it's on a diversion or it's running light, you know, between depots and garages and things like that. Um, and so um, you, you want to be uh, helping the driver at the time, whatever sort of uh, operation it's running. Um, so um, one of the um, things that the IBUS system does is whenever an alert gets triggered, um, even if it doesn't result in a in a strike, um, there's reports that are um, created and collected so that um, the um, route planners and operational staff can see where there are um, alerts being generated, um, which um, could be a sign that there's an accident just waiting to happen and, and what can we do to to avoid it. So it's worth thinking about that, you know, those near misses, um, how do we avoid the near misses as well as the actual strikes themselves. Um, if there is unfortunately a strike, then it creates major incident reports, um, which record all of the movements speed of the vehicle um, and those sort of things um, to help uh, the inevitable investigation um, and uh, every bus has been fitted with this since 2008 in London um, and um, because it's been around for long enough we know that um, it has led to a substantial reduction in the incidence of strikes, which is what we're trying to do. So we know it works. Um, and we know this approach works. That's much harder to understand elsewhere where um, there are, um, there's, there's less time that systems have been uh, in place. Um, so um, other systems that are around Ticketer, um, a year ago, well, just over a year ago, February last year, they launched their road restriction alert system on their ticket machines. Um, works pretty much like um, bus priority, um, using geofences and things like that. So um, it knows from mapping data where there are low bridges um, and um, you can tweak that to make sure that um, you've got as few false positives as you can. Um, and um, that triggers flashing things on, on the driver's screen, which is you know, usefully um, quite in the line of sight for, for drivers as well as uh, sounding alarms. Um, and again, like the iBus, it works whether the ticket machine is, is issuing tickets or uh, or not, as long as it's switched on. Um, and this was developed um, as a result of um, all of the um, changes happening because of COVID. Um, there was a lot of reallocations and routings. Um, you know, there was a lot of double deckers going on to previously single decker routes because you needed the capacity with social distancing in place and things like that. So um, it's one of the positives that's come out of um, COVID. Um, and um, it was originally piloted before it was uh, more widely available by first bus. Um, so that's Tikita. Um, Green Road, um, more often known for their um, general driver safety and fuel efficiency um, alerting and, and reporting um, systems. Um, but there was a lot of uh, coverage last year when Stagecoach committed to um, enhance their yeah, existing Green Road um, set up to um, have um, bridge alerts um, and you know, 
Stagecoach, they're not a small organisation. Um, they're, they're rolling this out last year to 8,000 coaches and buses. Um, and uh, of those, 3,800 were, were double deckers. So significant proportion of the, of the uh, UK fleet um, covered. Um, it's a simpler system than um, Ticketer and um, the iBus from a driver perspective. Um, they've got the, the red, amber, green driving alerts um, in, in line of sight. Um, and it just um, flashes red and makes a buzzing sound um, when, uh, when you've got a low bridge hazard. Um, there's an argument to say it's less distractive um, and achieves the same. So um, a, a slightly different approach, um, but fundamentally the same using uh, geolocation with GPS, um and um an audio and visual alerts um one of the um things that they seem to be um unique with um is the ability to set up locations for um other hazards um and and safety problem areas so you know, if there's a blind corner you can set up an alert um, so that the driver's alerted that you know there's a blind corner approaching, um, and so they might need to uh, to take a bit more care. So um, trying to avoid um, accidents and, and safety hazards um, more widely than just bridges. Um, time space. This is the um, this is the OAP of these solutions. It's been around for a good number of years now. Um, a lot of vehicles have got um, time space CCTV recorders on them um, already. This bolts onto um, the existing recorder um, and it's got a, um, a device that sits on the dashboard um, and um, again flashes lights and makes a noise at you. Um, uh, this one you can um, use um, pre-recorded messages um, if that's um, going to make more of an effect on the uh, on, on the driver, um, and as well as um, through the little um, device that's on there. Um, if you if the driver's got CCTV monitor, um, it puts up a message on that um, as well, um, and um, if you've got alerts set up in the CCTV re CCTV recording, then it'll mark where um, the um, uh, low bridge alert was was triggered, so that you can uh, easily find CCTV um, recording for it. Um, and it, a bit like the iBus, has got a uh, an early warning and, a, and an imminent warning um, alert as well. Um, so those are the, the three different technologies that um, we looked at in the report. Um, to bring it together, um, there isn't a single solution um, to um, Stopping buses, sitting low bridges. Um, it's a combination of things. It's a combination of operational activity, um, route planning, uh, making sure that the right vehicles are on the right route, as well as um, driver awareness of um, of the routes through route training and um, helping them with uh, technology systems that can can alert them by. Um, visual and audio um, methods. Um, there isn't really a quick fix. Um, it's a long, um, constant process um, to make sure that um, safety um, is is factored in. Um, so the report is available. Um, hopefully, it's going to get some coverage. Um, talking to coach and bus and uh, route one um, about 
um, doing articles um, and um, it's openly available um, as an RT document because we want to get the um, message out there and hopefully help people uh, avoid these um, um, nasty incidents. So that's um, the end of the presentation. I see we've got some um, questions in the chat. Um, so Nathaniel's, there's a YouTube channel, um, Bridge Collisions. Um, yeah, um, there's, do you think the usage of both measurement systems may serve to confuse drivers? Um, I think by the timing that was feet and meters. Um, road signs in the UK, Nathaniel, have got um, a mix of feet and meters. Um, where you've got meters, you have to have feet. Where you've got feet and inches, you don't have to have meters. So um, for those of us that are young enough to have grown up in the um, metric age, it can be a bit confusing when you see feet and you know your van that you drive is 196. Um, you go, how many feet is that? So yeah, I'm sure it does confuse drivers to an extent. Um, I'm not sure what we can do about it though. Um, so, and how extensively are scheduling systems uh, identifying low height risk and rerouting accordingly? Uh, is there a national database of low height hazards? So, there is um, through the Ordnance Survey um, a data set. Um, if you're subscribing um, to them and paying enough money to them, there is a data set that does cover um, bridges and the heights of bridges. Um, and that's where a number of the um, electronic systems um, get that data from. There are also other people that have got data sets like that. So um, Tom, Tom and Garmin um and nokia they've all got um height data sets that they use for their mapping systems um and they're used in sat navs for lorries and things like that as well so there's a number of sources of the data um but i don't know for the first part of the question how many operators actually are using scheduling systems that have got the low height risk functionality built in because some of it's down to the version of the software, how new it is as well as um, which modules they've bought. Um, so has anybody else got any questions? Um, so tree strikes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, it was a real problem back in the earlier days of um, real-time systems um, where buses for the first time started having antennas on the top of buses and things like that um, and they were getting knocked off um, and um, authorities like West Yorkshire got hold of open top buses and converted them into um, tree cutting vehicles and things like that. Um, there have always been a problem though, tree strikes, um, because the things grow every year and need chopping back or bashing it on a regular enough um, basis to, to keep them um, out of the way. Um, but uh, I'm, it seems to have gone off, the, certainly the conversations that I'm involved in, um tree strikes um i don't know whether we've got we got reading on because i know um they were going to be coming no we haven't because they did some work a couple of years ago with sensors on the top of their buses that uh, that enabled them to to produce maps of where there were problem trees and give them to their um council for chopping um, 
Okay, while um, people think of any other questions, I'll do some plugging for the um, next few um, uh, Arctic events. Um, at the end of the month, 28th of April, um, we've got a session to look at MQTT, which is the, the underlying technology that's being used in the new content management to display interface um, that we've um, produced some of um, and the work for graphical and things like displays and it carries on. But um, that introduces MQTT to the to the UK public transport market for the first time. Um, so there's lots of questions going on about how does it work and what does it do. So we'll try and answer those um, on the 28th of April. Um, then uh, the day after, um, the um, Analyze Bus Open Data Service latest. Um, features, which is excess waiting time, um, is um, going to be discussed and demoed. Um, that, I believe, will be available in ABODs from sometime next week, 11th or 12th, I think, um, if you want to have a play with that in advance. Um, and then um, towards the end of May, um, we're going to have another look at uh, bus priority at traffic lights, how our buses request priority and, and, and get that and the standards um, and what you need to do to make that happen. Um, and then we'll, uh, there'll, there'll be some more uh, earlier on in May um, around um, display to content management system and um, uh, and some others that we're uh, that we're planning, but we're not quite able to um, announce at the moment. So, if there aren't any other questions, um, I would like to thank you for attending. Um, if you want to get in contact um, with me, details are on the screen. Happy to discuss. Um, bridge strikes or anything else that we're doing or you think we should be doing. Um, we have been recording this um, and so the uh, the slides and the recording will uh, will make available um, in the next few days for you um, and colleagues that couldn't make it. So thank you for your time this lunchtime and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.